Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's QMED webinar, Testing Requirements for a Successful Medical Device Sterilization Validation, sponsored by Eurofins Medical Device Testing and broadcast by Informa. With extensive knowledge of the commercialization process, regulatory requirements, and scientific trends in the industry, Eurofins Medical Device Testing offers regulatory compliance expertise and experience GMP, GLP, ISO, 17025 testing to ensure rapid turnaround times with the highest level of service and most advanced technologies for your analytical chemical, microbiological, biocompatibility, electrical, mechanical, and package testing needs. Eurofins Medical Device Testing's scientists and engineers have been assisting companies, large and small, with developmental testing for more than 40 years. And their global network of greater than 20 laboratories in North America, Europe, and Asia Pacific provide extensive, extensive capacity at the highest level of instrument technology with a full scope of testing services. I'm Chris Keach, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few brief announcements before we begin. First, this webinar is designed to be interactive. The dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow you to learn about today's speakers, share this webinar via social media outlets, and participate in our Q&A session that takes place at the end of our presentation. If we're not able to answer all your submitted questions during, during today's webinar, we'll be sure to share them with our speaker who can reply to you offline after the program is over. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event and after the webinar, we will ask you to complete our survey found on the right-hand side of your screen. Please take a moment to fill this out before leaving us today, as your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. And lastly, if you're experiencing any technical problems, please click on the Help widget found at the bottom of your screen, or type your issue into the Q&A text area, and we will be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. And now, on to the presentation, Testing Requirements for a Successful Medical Device Sterilization Validation. Discussing today's topics are Fergus O'Connell and Jennifer Wan. Fergus has 20 years of, ex of QA experience in the pharmaceutical industry within manufacturing, sterile inhalations, and solid dosage forms, and analytical testing. He worked as European qualified person responsible for the release of finished products to markets in the USA, Europe, and the Asia Pacific region. He is currently the head of quality for Eurofins medical device testing in Australia and New Zealand. And Jennifer is the division leader for Eurofins, Eurofins medical device testing in Australia and New Zealand. Jennifer is a microbiologist and has worked in the pharmaceutical and medical device industries for over 20 years. During this time, she has been involved in supporting medical device manufacturers to design and execute successful medical device sterilization validations for regulatory approval. To learn more about our speakers, please visit the BIOS widget. It's now with great pleasure I'm going to turn this special session over to Fergus to begin. Fergus, take it away. Thank you, Chris, and welcome everybody to today's webinar. Um, the agenda for today's webinar is going to address the fundamentals of sterilization. Uh, we're going to look at some different modalities used for sterilizing medical devices. We're going to focus a little bit um, on ethylene oxide and its residual testing. Um, Jennifer is going to cover irradiation sterilization, and um, we're then going to proceed into bioburden testing and control, and then the actual test for sterility itself. Now, the fundamentals of sterilization, um, in order to produce a sterile medical device, of course, it is one that is going to be free of viable microorganisms. And in order to supply such um, medical devices in a sterile state, we must minimize the microbiological contamination present under the device. Now, inactivation of the microbiological contaminants um, is known as the process of sterilization. Now, you should bear in mind that the inactivation kinetics of sterilization is demonstrated by an exponential relationship between the surviving population and the extent of treatment with the sterilizing agent. In other words, there's going to be a finite probability of survivors. Now, the probability of survival is influenced by both the number and the resistance of the microorganisms present on the device. Now, you should also bear in mind that sterility is not guaranteed by the process of sterilization, and it is defined in terms of its probability. So a successful outcome is dependent on a validated and controlled process. So within this slide, we're going to look at some of the different modalities that are chosen by manufacturers in order to produce a sterile medical devices. Um, now, the different requirements from the medical devices will influence which modality is chosen. And also, we need to um, assess the compatibility of the material 
um, that is being um, presented for sterilization. I'm going to draw your attention to um, the EO sterilization over on the right-hand side of the screen here, um, where the ability for gas to permeate um, into the product and the packaging and then dissipate out from the product and the packaging is essential to whether or not this modality can be used. Um, I will also note, note that um, the, the EO sterilization process is compatible with the largest um, array of different materials versus the other modalities. At the bottom of the screen here, you'll, you'll look at the processing time. Um, again, when we focus on EO sterilization over on the right-hand side, we're measuring EO sterilization in a matter of days rather than in the hours, as is attributable to the other different modalities, um, such as uh, gamma irradiation. So why choose EO, EO sterilization? Well, it's primarily used for heat and or moisture sensitive medical devices that cannot be moist heat sterilized by the traditional 121 degrees Celsius for greater than 15 minutes. So ISO 11135 describes requirements which, if met, will provide an EO sterilization process which is intended for um, sterilizing medical devices, which, is a, which has appropriate microbicidal activity and provides sterile products with a high degree of confidence. As mentioned previously, the purpose of sterilization is to inactivate the microbiological contaminants present on the, on the device. Now, when we're looking at ethylene oxide for sterilization, we must ensure that the levels of ethylene oxide, ethylene chlorohydrin, and ethylene glycol pose a minimum risk to patients during normal use of the product. And we need to assess these and consider these factors when we're, when we're um, designing our products, our medical devices, um, and where an alternative material or sterilization process is available, it should be considered. And this is basically because ethylene oxide is known to exhibit a number of biological effects, such as irritation, mutagenicity, carcinogenicity, et cetera. Now, in practice, for most devices, ethylene oxide and ethylene chlorohydrin is considerably lower than a maximum value specified by ISO 10993. So when we choose or have made the choice to use ethylene sterilization, the exposure to um, ethylene oxide residues uh, must be minimized. Now, we basically categorize um, medical devices based on their level of exposure, being limited exposure less than 24 hours, prolonged exposure between one day and 30 days, and permanent contact, which is exposure of greater than 30 days in duration. And there are different limits which are set for each of these groups, and we're going to get into that a little bit later in the webinar. So the keys to successful um, sterilization um, is going to involve a number of different factors, such as the microbial status of incoming raw materials and or components. And what we're talking about here is basically the total level of bio burden on the medical device when it is being sent for sterilization. We're also going to be considering the validation and routine control of cleaning and the disinfection process. Um, the control of the manufacturing environment, the control of the equipment processes and personnel hygiene, and the quality of the packaging along with the product storage. The type of contaminant on the device can impact success. So we need to define the entire sterilization process and all of the equipment involved. Now, if your process already exists, in other words, if you're using ethylene oxide for sterilizing one of your other medical devices, you, and you're bringing a new product online or making a, a variation to an existing product, you only need to review the identify, ent identified variables, um, which, is, which is required for inclusion in the process specifications for routine production. Now, next in our webinar, we're going to focus a little bit more on the following items, such as EO processing characterization, um, equipment characterization, product and process definition, and the validation of the process itself. So with EO sterilization, we have three distinct phases. There's the, the preconditioning, um, which, um, if used, involves time, temperature, humidity, and transfer time. The sterilization cycle itself, which involves the exposure, time, temperature, humidity, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about humidity in the next slide, and the pressure. And aeration, if used, is a factor um, of time and temperature. Now, we, I will note that here that aeration is only considered a process variable if aeration is considered to contribute to ensuring the microbicidal effectiveness of the sterilization process. So you need to define the product to be sterilized quite well. And in order to do that, you need to look at the microbiological quality of the, um, of the device prior to sterilization. Now, I will give you um, um, a quick note here that basically desiccated cells are, are known to be more resistant to ethylene oxide 
um, than, than, um, than normal cells with a normal um, level of moisture within the cells. And we, can all, we also know that it's difficult to kill microbes which have been dried on impervious um, surfaces. Now, partially, uh, this is partially overcome by increasing the relative humidity um, prior to sterilization and then also during the sterilization process itself. So this is, this is quite important. We must also define quite well the manner in which the product is to be packaged and presented for sterilization. Now, as part of your product design, you're going to be, um, you're going to be looking at certain configurations and, um, and packaging, et cetera, which must allow the removal of air, which if, if, if that is applicable. It must allow the penetration of heat, humidity, ethylene oxide gas, obviously, during the sterilization process, and the removal of ethylene oxide gas at the end of the process. So the sterilization process, like any other process in manufacturing, must be defined with equipment um, for which has undergone installation qualification and operational qualification. I'm not going to focus on those two elements. I think everybody in the industry is, is well, averse, well across those. But performance qualification used, um, uses a product and or a material to demonstrate the equipment consistently operates in accordance with predetermined acceptance criteria, and the process produces a sterile product. Now, performance qualification should be carried out for each new process, including process modifications and or product. We're not going to focus a little bit on the performance qualifications specifically used for ethylene oxide sterilization and testing. So, EO performance qualification consists both of microbiological and physical performance qualification. I know this is performed in equipment used to actually sterilize the product during routine manufacturing. Key considerations here are to specify the product presentation and load configurations. The load configuration must represent that to be routinely sterilized and defined based on the most challenging routine load. Now, we need to evaluate the impact of variable load configurations if they are used. If you're, going to only, if you're going to be packing your chamber to only 50% of its capacity, you need to understand the impact of that on your actual finished product, especially where ethylene oxide residues are concerned. Now, if a material other than the product is used, this must present an equivalent or greater challenge to the process as that, that will be presented by the product itself. Now, you can also use chemical indicators for this process as defined by ISO 14140. However, I will caution you that chemical indicators will only um, indicate to you that um, the ethylene box oxide has actually traveled in there. It will not necessarily demonstrate um, that the um, sterilization process has been effective. For that, you require microbiological evaluation. So in order to, uh, to demonstrate microbiological uh, performance qualification, we must demonstrate that the, um, the requirements for sterility have been met, and we need, to study, um, uh, we need to study basically the performance of the process at certain parameters to um, and ensure that they deliver less lethality than the specified EO sterilization process. And this is used to confirm the effectiveness of the defined process for the product or load combination. Now, when we look at cycle lethality, we have one of two methods um, which we will use in the laboratory um, and in the process basically to determine whether or not the cycle um, is, is effective and also to determine how much exposure a medical device is, is required to receive in order to achieve that sterilization. So the, we can use the biological indicator or the bioburden approach, and this approach combines knowledge of the resistance of a biological indicator to a given sterilization process, um, the knowledge of the bioburden population and its resistance um, itself. And it's used to establish the process parameters that we're going to use during normal manufacturing. Now, this particular approach requires um, a product bioburden levels, levels to be relatively consistent over time, and we mentioned earlier about manu uh, controlling your incoming raw materials and your manufacturing process. This is what um, this is what um, this is particularly pointing to. And we also want to know about the biological bioburden resistance to be equal to or less resistant than that of the biological indicator itself. Now, both of these items must be demonstrated as part of the um, evaluation study. Now, to demonstrate the resistance of the positive, pro, positive control devices, we need to run cycles at graded exposure times, or we can expose graded BI populations to a single sterilization exposure time. And what I mean by graded biological uh, populations here is that we have biological indicators with different numbers of spore, spores present on it, and then we will assess which ones will show growth and which ones will um, have been actually sterilized by the process um, that, we, that we are proposing to use. So 
for biological indicators, we need to uh, demonstrate that the incubate, incubation times um, that, or the sterilization process um, is capable um, of recovering growth um, if it is present on the biological um, or positive um, device control or positive control device. And we basically need to show, or at least to demonstrate, that we can, um, we, can, we can recover any delayed outgrowth of spores if they are present. So determining the lethality of the process after a time-graded exposure or, as previously mentioned, the population-graded BIs, we do it by either direct enumeration, a fractional negative method, which is determining the number of PCDs which have been sterilized against those which have not been sterilized, or a combination of both. Now, when we're using this, we need to ensure that all other process parameters remain the same, otherwise the data cannot be directly compared. Typically, medical device use, uh, manufacturers will use an overkill procedure, which is um, creating those PCD devices that we mentioned earlier on. Um, and it uses um, BIs with no number of microorganisms and with known resistance to ethylene oxide. And it places BIs in the product itself at the most difficult to sterilize locations, or we inoculate the product um, at the most difficult um, to sterilize locations. If the at most, or most difficult to sterilize location cannot be achieved, you need to establish the relationship of the location that you're using against that which you have proposed to be the most difficult to use. Now, you can use PCDs with equivalent or greater microbiological res resistance to the sterilization pro process than the, um, than the product itself. Now, in order to um, employ an overkill approach, we have to establish what the half cycle um, is going to look like. So we basically have three consecutive experiments which result in total inactivation of the biological indicators. Now, the biological indicators will be greater than 10 to the 6 um, scores on the, on the device and will be placed into a positive control device. The specified exposure time for the sterilization process is then doubled um, that used in the experiment. And this is basically where the name um, overkill comes from. Um, and basically, we also have a, a fractional or short duration cycle must also be run, and this is to ensure that BI survivors can be recovered if they are, um, if they are present. And essentially, in the lab, we need to demonstrate that if a, if a spore has been sub-lethally um, inactivated, that we can, we can basically bring it back to full health and recover it um, if it is present. And this demonstrates the adequacy of the BI recovery technique for isolates exposed to the gas. Now, the cycle calculation approach uses a graded exposure um, to the standard BI populations or a population graded BIs exposed to a single EO exposure time previously discussed. And again, the routine process parameters that deliver at least a 12 standard log reduction shall be calculated and then used during normal, normal production. Now, in the next two slides, we're, we've, we've just included here some of the limits um, for the different characterized medical devices. You'll see on this slide that we have data relating to the permanent contact devices, and I remind you that these are devices which have exposure times of greater than 30 days. Um, you'll note that the first 24 hours and then the, third, the pr prolonged um, exposure within the, the, the first 30 days um, increases, obviously, and then the, the, the lifetime exposure, which is, um, which is also indicated here. On this particular slide, we um, have also indicated the um, exposure levels for um, prolonged exposure devices, and then at the bottom here, and the limited exposure devices, for, which are less than 24 hours. Now, when we get the medical devices in for, um, in for testing, we are basically going to determine the compliance with the set limits. Um, and the, the testing consists of extracting the residue from the samples, determining the amount of EO residues um, present, determining the contact surface of the device, and analyzing and interpreting the data. Now, the determination of the residue um, can be done by, um, by a method of extraction and, a measure, and the measurement is required to determine the amount of EO um, and where necessary ethylene chlorohydrin um, delivered to the patient. And any analytically sound method can be used in order to, uh, in order to demonstrate that. Now, when we into our, our designing our medical devices, we need to um, take a number of different considerations into into um, into um, or bear them and bear them in mind. There's an enormous diversity of materials and methods um, used to construct medical devices, and some present problems, or greater problems, um, in determining residual um, ethylene oxide and ECH levels um, than others. Um, examples such as of challenging device designs include including um, devices with long tubing with small internal diameters, 
these prove difficult for the gas to enter and then to dissipate post the sterilization process. But also products which are packed in multiple tieback packaging, and the packaging will stop or reduce the entry on dissipation of the EO gas out from the device unless sufficiently aerated. Stockinettes in cotton and terry materials are also highly absorbent, and generally they have a very high EO levels. Um, if these are tightly packed, for example, um, the most difficult, um, the most of the surface area is sealed, and therefore aeration will not proceed. Now, if we use heated aeration um, during the, um, the post-sterilization post process, it helps to reduce the levels into compliance. Plastics, especially hard plastics, are also notoriously uh, difficult um, to, um, to dissipate. They will retain high levels of ethylene oxide, and heated aeration is, um, is again, increased or helps to reduce the levels of, um, of ethylene oxide present on the device. So when we're selecting um, med our uh, samples for testing, we need to uh, factor in a number of, or, or consider a number of different items. Um, the material composition, whether or not it's going to um, absorb or retain um, ethylene oxide gas. The packaging needs to be considered, uh, as these materials vary widely in their abilities to allow the penetration of gas. Um, and also packaging and, and shipping container densities are sources of vari variability as well. So ethylene oxide sterilization um, process or cycle, the process conditions will affect the residual levels. Um, higher um, concentrations of gas, longer exposure times, et cetera, will all, all impact. And the aeration of the ethylene oxide in the devices may vary as a function of temperature, load density, airflow, et cetera. And obviously, um, aeration time is going to, be uh, going to be a significant factor here. Now, when we're um, selecting an appropriate extraction method, again, we go back to how we have characterized the, um, the medical device in the first place. So, so limited exposure devices are, um, are extracted using simulated use, um, and permanent contact devices uh, use an exhaustive um, extraction process. Now, devices in the prolonged exposure category must also meet the residual requirements of limited exposure, and devices in the permanent contact category must also meet the requirements in the prolonged exposure and the limited exposure uh, categories, whichever extraction condition has been used. So the simulated ex use extraction basically evaluates the residual levels available to the patient or other use device users during routine use of the medical device um, you, with water extraction to simulate product use. Ex exhaustive extraction is an extraction exercise which is performed until the amount of ethylene oxide or ethylene chlorohydrin is in a subsequent extraction is less than 10% of that detected in the first extraction or until there is no analytically significant increase in the cumulative residue levels. So simulated use extraction and using total immersion, um, once the device is too large to be extracted in its entirety, it is necessary to extract several portions of the device components in one of two ways. We take, if several varied materials are used, a portion of the component as compared to the total sample mass um, should, should reflect the ratio of that component to the total mass of the device being tested, or we select one of the components for testing subsequent to an evaluation demonstrating that it presented or represented the worst case with regards to residual testing. Devices which are um, large, such as drapes and sponges, we will have duplicate samples and they must be set up for extraction from the same device. Just as a quick um, case study, um, just uh, for an implantable medical device, just as an example, if we're looking for a sterility assurance level of 10 to the 6, um, and it's a permanent um, contact device, um, we're going to have allowable limits of 0 0.1 milligrams per day. The extraction method that we would select inside the lab for this analysis will be simulated to use, including exhaustive extraction. Now, with that, I'm going to hand it over to, um, to, to Jennifer Wan to go through um, irradiation sterilization, and, um, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Fergus. All right, today I'm going to talk about irradiation sterilization. Specifically, we're going to have a look at the testing requirements that are used in establishing the sterilization dose when employing the method of irradiation sterilization. So as mentioned previously, we have a number of options available for irradiation sterilization, whether they be gamma irradiation, which is probably one of the more common methods, uh, e-beam irradiation, or potentially x-ray irradiation. 
So today for, uh, for the case study, we'll be taking a closer look at gamma irradiation. Uh, we're going to follow specifically the ISO standards, which set out very specific and prescriptive requirements on how we establish the doses and the subsequent validation, testing and monitoring that are employed in controlling these processes. So two approaches can be used to establish the sterilization dose. We can either do this through a dose setting exercise to obtain a specific dose that we intend as our sterilization dose, or we can use a dose substantiation to verify a pre-selected dose, more commonly uh, at the upper limit of say 25 kilogray, or potentially a lower dose of 15 kilogray. Obviously, depending on which dose you have, you have to have a good knowledge of what your bio burden is because they have very prescriptive and precise limits of the allowable bio burden for each. So going through our dose setting exercise, we begin by using data that's derived from an activation of microbial population in its natural state on the product. So with this exercise, we're not introducing an artificial inoculum onto the product. We're merely taking a determination of, of what the bio burden is in its most natural state. Based upon the probability model for in, inactivation, we assume each different species in the bio burden population has its own D value. And this we know because of the different resistance patterns of various different organisms. The probability of a microorganism surviving after radiation exposure at a given dose is defined in terms of the initial number of microorganisms on the product prior to irradiation and then the D10 values of the microorganism itself. The method involves the test of sterility on a product that has received doses of radiation lower than that of the final sterilization dose. This is then used to set the dose needed to achieve a predetermined sterility assurance level. Now in our dose substantiation access uh, process, we commonly refer to this uh, as a VDMAX method. Similar to the dose setting exercise, however, the derived sterilization dose is predetermined and is already set at a known dose to achieve a known sterility assurance level. Now, based upon these well-documented uh, calcula calculations, which if you have trouble sleeping, you can, uh, you can avail yourself to in the ISO standard, we're using a VDMAX 25 uh, substantiation dose to achieve a SAL of 10 to the minus 6 and a VD max 15 is used where products have a bio burden of less than 1.5 CFU. Uh, to go through the full processes of establishing our sterilization dose, uh, first we need to identify the product definition we need to select our product. We also need to determine the actual bio burden on the product. We then go through the dose establishment and setting, and finally the sterilization dose followed by sterility testing. Now a word on product families. Uh, products may be grouped into families. Um, where we make this decision to do so, there should be a justified uh, rationale behind this decision. Now, families can be based upon the number and types uh, of microorganisms present on the product. So to do this, we have to have an understanding of the identity of the microorganisms uh, and also the numbers of each of those types of microorganisms. And this is important because we know that different microorganisms present different resistance patterns to sterilization processes. We can also consider when determining uh, our product families, the source of the raw materials, uh, the components that are used in the assembly, the product design and its size, the manufacturing process, equipment, and the manufacturing environment as well. Now product families may be represented by a master product. Uh, and this is commonly used when we're dealing with um, multiple device packages such as procedure kits which are, are used uh, in surgical procedures. So we like to demonstrate a worst case scenario where we use uh, the highest number of 
different types of products, probably with the most complex presentation as well. So when we go through selection of product for testing, we do have to give some consideration um, to the types of products uh, and, and what is most appropriate and representative. So we've got here from ISO 11137, we've got a table uh, depicting the details um, of, of how we go through this selection process. So another quick note on sample item portion. Um, in certain circumstances where it's not appropriate or practical to use the entire device uh, in our bioburden testing process, we can actually use a part of the device. Um, now we always aim to use as much of the device or all of the device if possible. Uh, however, if that is not achievable because of some practical limitations. If we're talking about catheter tubing that goes on for two or three meters, um, testing the whole portion of that is, is going to be a challenging process. So what we can do is um, we can go through a risk assessment to determine um, what a suitable and justifiable sample item portion might look like. So the product should be assessed to determine if the buyer burden is evenly distributed. If not, we should consider taking the sample item portion from the product portion that is considered to be the most challenging to the sterilization process. Now, in preparation of producing the sample item portion, we should not alter the buyer burden on the product. So we don't want to add or remove uh, any buyer burden during this processing because it is an additional step that wouldn't normally be part of your manufacturing process. Uh, and at the end of all this, we should determine whether or not the sample item portion is adequate. So different, um, different calculations can be used. We could make this basis upon length. For example, uh, in tubing, we could make this calculation assessment based upon mass, volume, or the surface area. So we're going to look now um, in particular detail to the actual buyer burden testing uh, of all of these products. So last year we had some updates to ISO 11737, which is of course the international standard that we use to, um, to follow the method. Um, some of the updates in particular were a discussion around buyer burden spikes and that these spikes are now considered to be normal occurrences on your product. Uh, the package testing is not typically required unless the package testing itself um, forms some inherent uh, part of your medical device. There was also an introduction of the MPN technique used to quantify buyer burden. There was some verbiage around suggested improvements to limits of detection, particularly important when we're looking to either um, test very low buyer burden products uh, and recovery can be challenging. There was some information provided on method suitability tests. Um, a discussion around direct plate count rules and estimation, which are probably normal um, from a microbiological perspective. Uh, and there was also a very good table that was introduced into this version of the standard detailing the responsibilities between the laboratories and the manufacturers. And this really just goes to show that um, obviously the manufacturers have a very good understanding of the product um, and some of the information pertaining to that product and the laboratories are probably best poised to make uh, decisions regarding the testing of the product. Uh, and there was an emphasis placed upon um, risk-based approaches. So going through our bioburden testing, um, a simple breakdown of, uh, of the steps involved. We have our sample item selection, uh, a collection of the items for tests, send them off to the laboratory where they undergo an extraction procedure. Uh, where we elute the microorganisms off the product 
We then transfer the microorganisms into a suitably validated culture media for incubation. Uh, the time of the incubation also needs to be validated. Uh, we then go through a process of quantifying our bio burden and characterizing the bio burden as well, followed by the interpretation of that data. So we've got here a decision tree that is detailed uh, in ISO 11737. Um, and really this is, I suppose, to help us guide us uh, into determining what are possible techniques. This is not an exhaustive decision tree, but it is a practical tool that's used uh, certainly in our laboratory when deciding which is the most appropriate method of microorganism removal from a device. So some of the uh, techniques that we may use, we may use um, a mixing technique, we may use um, a sonication technique, um, and we can also use um, a, a manual massage technique. Uh, we tend not to use a swabbing technique if at all avoidable, simply due to the low recovery uh, of, of that particular method. Um, so we've just got here a discussion on the extraction procedure and two approaches that we can take to determining how sufficient uh, or effective uh, that, um, that extraction procedure is. So um, there's, there's basically two approaches we can use, which is a repetitive rinsing technique, which means that we, um, we submit the device to multiple extractions and we enumerate in separate elution portions uh, the numbers of bio burden coming off that product in each rinse. We then look to determine where the most significant drop off is and we use that to determine our correction factor for, uh, for the recovery. We can also use an inoculation technique, which means that we artificially seed um, a, a bio burden, a spore suspension, for example, a known type of organism and a known quantity of organism onto the product. Because we know how much we've put onto the product, when we determine what we're recovering, we can very easily uh, express the recovery rate uh, as a percentage. So we've got a, a quick example of a calculation that we can run through um, to show you how this is determined. So here we've used um, we've used an inoculation technique where we've um, inoculated an average count of 100 CFU uh, onto the device. We've tested three devices. We then determine the percentage recovery of that device. Uh, and then we, we work out our correction factor based upon that. Now there's probably two ways that you can apply uh, the correction factor data to your final result and that is to simply take an average um, of the multiple um, recoveries that you've derived or you can actually use um, the lowest recovery and apply a worst case scenario so that you're not in danger of underestimating your buyer burden. Now with the enumeration uh, of our bio burden, there is a number of techniques um, that we use in the laboratory where we um, have a different range of media available uh, for use and that's really going to depend on what types of organisms we're expecting to recover. So you do have to have some pre-knowledge if you like of, of what your anticipated population is going to be and this should be established as part of your validation program. Um, so some of the more common um, media that we use, tryptone soya agar, uh, nutrient agar for example, if we're looking um, for example at uh, yeast and moulds, we'll use a SDA agar or a potato dextrose um, and we may also be looking to target anaerobic bacteria if, uh, if that is a concern for your product. Um, and then we've also listed there, um, or I should say the, the standard is listed suggested incubation conditions um, in terms of time and temperature. But again, this has to be suitably validated um, for your device and your population. 
So in terms of characterizing the buyer burden, again, uh, the reason that we're looking to characterize the buyer burden is so that we have a good understanding of the different types of organisms that are present on the product. Um, there are different uh, techniques that we can employ with uh, differing levels of, of uh, sensitivity and specificity as well. So we could use a very crude measure such as uh, colony morphology on the plate where we're, we're looking macroscopically uh, at the different types of cultures that are present on the product. Um, a good microbiologist will, will probably be able to give you an indication of what that is likely to be at a genus level. Um, but, uh, but you are relying on, on some experience there and there's a degree of subjectivity uh, in that interpretation, of course. Um, we could then go on to a microscopic method using uh, cell morphology uh, where we're looking down the microscope um, at a stain of a, a pure isolate where we'll be examining uh, the shape of the cells, the size um, and the aggregation as well can give us some indications of, of what that microorganism is likely to be. Um, different types of staining can also be used, um, but then we, we also have access to more modern and reliable techniques um, which are, are far less subjective than, uh, than these earlier techniques such as using um, species identification through uh, multi-TOF or through genetic sequencing to, um, to get as accurate as possible. Uh, and again, this can be quite important when you're dealing with uh, different types of spore formers and you know that you're at your upper end of, um, of the allowable buyer burden for your chosen sterilization design, uh, dose. So really it's, it's about selecting uh, a method that is going to be appropriate for, uh, for justifying the risk where you're at. So in terms of our, um, our dose establishment, we've, we've got two methods that are available to us, uh, method one and method two from, um, from the standard. However, these first two methods um, rely upon, uh, again, dose setting using the bio burden information uh, or dose setting using a fraction positive information from incremental increases in the dose to determine an extrapolation factor. So a, a note on these two methods um, and approaches, they, they are rather labor intensive um, and do require uh, the availability of a significant amount of product available because you are looking at doing sort of at least 100 individual sterility tests. Um, and obviously if you've got a, a complex and valuable medical device, that, uh, that approach can be quite onerous. Um, so for practical reasons, um, the, the method that's probably more commonly employed uh, is a VD Max method and, and we'll take you through that um, in precise detail now. Uh, so again, we, we go through, obtain our products, um, we determine our buyer burden um, and then we're we need to select um, our final sterilization dose. So generally 25 kilogram, um, or if we're looking uh, at a particular product which cannot withstand that level of gamma radiation, uh, we may also consider using uh, 15 kilogram, but of course that comes with, um, with the prerequisite that we're having a much lower buyer burden uh, challenge on that product in order to use that. So with our verification dose experiment, this is done on 10 products for a single batch. Uh, we need to irradiate the 10 products um, at the prescribed dose based upon our, our buyer burden. We then subject, uh, subject these 10 devices uh, to individual tests of sterility. Uh, there's then an interpretation uh, of those results as well. We can accept the verification if no more than one positive um, results from those sterility tests, or we can perform a confirmatory dose verification if there are two positives. However, if there are greater than two positives, we cannot accept that verification dose. So we've got here just a, a quick state, uh, case study from the standard that, um, that runs through the numbers for you um, in terms of calculating everything out from our average buyer burden um, for that particular batch. Uh, so we've come up with an average buyer burden of 100 CFU. 
Um, we then look at the corresponding verification dose for a 25 kilogray uh, final sterilization and an SAL of 10 to the 6. Um, and our corresponding verification dose is 8.1 kilogray. We uh, subject all 10 products to that verification dose and then we perform 10 individual sterility tests. Um, if we get zero positives, uh, then we can safely determine that the verification dose has been successful uh, and we can employ that final uh, sterilization of 25 kilogray uh, as our sterilizing dose. So we've included here uh, the references, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, that, um, that you can go through in more detail to find any of the information uh, that we've, we've covered off today. Uh, and now I'll hand it back to Chris uh, for our Q&A session. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Fergus, for a great presentation. We're now going to move on to the question and answer portion of our event. As a reminder to participate in our Q&A session, simply type your question into the text box located to the right of the presentation window or click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Type your question in and then click the Submit button. Please note that we'll try to get to as many questions as we can in the time that we have left. If we're unable to get to your question today, someone will get back to you after the program is over. So with that, let's get started with some questions. We've got several questions, actually quite a few questions coming in. So we're going to get started here with our first one. Uh, which is the better sterilization method? I think really, Chris, that is going to be entirely dependent on what is your product. Um, as mentioned before, probably the, the most commonly available sterilization method uh, would either be gas or irradiation. Um, and it really is going to come down to, to product um, compatibility. So there are some limitations with certain types of plastics and polymers, for example, um, with gamma irradiation in that they simply cannot withstand that with, without becoming uh, quite brittle and, and fragile. Um, obviously, EO um, doesn't affect plastics in the same way um, gamma does. However, the EO gas itself is, is quite toxic, so we do have to ensure that we can go through an appropriate aeration uh, procedure to release the gas from the product um, and ensure that we haven't got residuals remaining after the sterilization process. Having said that, there are some issues as well when we're using EO gas, we're also employing um, an elevated temperature and an elevated level of humidity, and that can pose a problem to um, to certain types of materials. So, really, it's going to be entirely dependent on what the material is that your device is made up of, um, how much time you've got, and uh, and and really what what the material can withstand. All right, thank you, Jennifer. And just as a reminder to the audience, if, you, if you're not finding the slides on, under the resource widget, please refresh your screen and it will appear under the title uh, Download Slides. So we're going to move on now with our next question here. Our second question, what is the frequency required for, for uh, bio-burden testing? Well, that is very much dependent on your, um, on, your, on your aversion to risk. Now, we recommend to clients that they should be typically characterizing the bio burden on their, um, on their devices on a, on most likely on an annual basis because the bio burden can change over time, um, especially if there's variations in your manufacturing process and your incoming uh, materials, as I mentioned earlier in the webinar. Um, so having control of those processes, um, um, then we are... Um, that is important um, to do. We can also increase um, to, uh, to do that on a quarterly basis. Um, but um, again, it comes down to what your, 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 uh, your assessment of your process and the control of your processes. All right, thank you, Fergus. We have another question here that says, what level of bio burden characterization is required for EO sterilization? So for EO sterilization, you need to um, you need to characterize whether or not your uh, your particular bio burden is going to be um, resistant or more resistant to those um, typically used as part of your um, your biological indicators. Now, Bacillus atrophius spores are typically used for EO sterilization processes, so you would need to need to demonstrate that your uh, that your your um, bio burden is um, is not more resistant to the uh, Bacillus atrophius spores if, in order to to demonstrate that. 
when you use that particular organism to indicate your process or to characterize your process, that you're um, that you're 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 not um, basically underestimating um, the, um, the 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 resistance of the bio burden normally present on the device. All right, thank you, Fergus. We have another question here that says, for a bio burden validation, should we use only one run of media or also test on three runs of media? So with your with your media, um, so as long as your your media production process or your um, your or from whom you're using or sourcing your material, as long as they have been suitably qualified and the media has passed its um, pharmacopeial quali um, quality checks, um, there is no distinct requirement to use um, separate lots of media. All right, thank you, Fergus. So we have another bio burden question here. So for bio burden approach or for the bio burden approach. Uh, we are not using PCDs. You, 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 um, you're just basically determining the total number of your typical, your, your typical, sorry, the bio, bio burden count on your typical uh, device. Um, you can use PCDs, um, but for the, for, for the bio burden approach, you're, you're just, um, it's, it's not an absolute requirement. All right, thank you, Fergus. And uh, for a product with a, with low bio burden recommended, is inoculate is the, let me read this again here. For product with low bio burden recommendations, is inoculation method. What bacteria are recommended, and what place should we inoculate on the product? So thanks for that, Chris. Um, good question. So when we're dealing with um, with the requirement to inoculate uh, a product to determine its um, the, the bio burden recovery method, we really need to, um, you, you want to use something that's particularly hardy to work with that's not going to die during the testing process. So using a bacillus organism, for example, um, and, and using a spore um, can alleviate some of those issues in terms of die off during the testing process. Um, and also in terms of where that product should be inoculated, you really should be inoculating it probably in really the, the most challenging areas um, that are going to be to extract the organism off that. So that's anywhere where there's a high degree of, uh, of folding or material layering, um, really getting into, into those hard to reach places. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, another question here on the bio burden approach. H how do we choose BI and compare it, uh, its D value with the resistance of the actual bio burden, and how do we do it? The the D the D value is catchy. So if for that for that um, particular approach, you would have to do the um, the fractional negative um, method, um, and you would you would have to basically demonstrate over over a, over a um, basically you have to do a standard curve of, of, of inactivation, um, and from that you would calculate your D value. All right, thank you, Fergus. We'll move on to the next question here. Uh, which could be the best strategy to adopt or change from GABA, uh, from gamma to, to e-bean? So this is this is coming back to your characterization. This would be um, this would be conducted using a risk assessment approach, and um, you'd have to uh, uh, characterize your um, your your product and its compatibility with the with the e-beam um, e-beam sterilization modality. So again, going Thank back to Jennifer's you. earlier okay. point, there's 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 no there's there's no there's no sterilization method that is necessarily better than the other. They they are all capable of achieving sterility. It's just whether or not the um, the material compatibility with the sterilization mode that modality lends itself to that method of sterilization. All right, thank you, Fergus. Uh, can you talk about what equipment is recommended to measure the EOECH residuals? Yeah, sure. So um, that's a volatile gas, and we use um, we we determine the quantification um, by gas chromatography uh, with a FID detector. Thank you, Jennifer. Looks like we have another question here that says. Um, if packaging sterilization and shelf life is validating uh, using gamma, would one need to validate again for e-beam? Look, I'm going to say in all likelihood, the amount of testing that you would be required to do for the justification of moving from one method to the other 
would probably be around the same amount of testing um, that would be required to, to be done uh, in order to go through a, a new validation. But um, again, it, it's going to depend upon the complexity of the product um, and the risk of that product as well. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, another question came in that asks, how do you know the inoculated challenge will have the same adherence and recovery as the wild population? Look, that's a good question, um, and that's not something that you can easily uh, identify or quantify, which is why the standard um, really does guide us to wherever we can um, to, use, um, to use the natural bio burden present on the product. Having said that, we do try and ensure in the laboratory when we are inoculating the product um, that we do it, I suppose, in the same fashion that um, that we would in terms of um, how the device would, would come to um, have bio burden on it, for example. So we um, inoculate the uh, bio burden relatively evenly and we also ensure that we allow the device um, to dry before, um, before we go through an extraction process. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, another question here asks, how often do you need to, to, uh, to do a dose audit verification? Yeah, so the, the dose audit verification, again, it's it's going to come down to, I suppose, what um, what experience you have with that particular product. Um, but I would say as a, as a minimum requirement, you want to be doing this quarterly. Thank you, Jennifer. A lot of questions coming in. And again, as a, as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, just type your question into the Q&A text area or click on the Q&A icon and type your question in. Click Submit. We'll get to as many as we can here in the few minutes we have left. Again, if we didn't get to your question today or if we don't get to your question today, someone will get back to you after the program is over. So let's continue on with some more questions. Uh, another question here says, does external PCD have to be more resistant than the internal PCD? Yeah, so um, so there is a requirement where we are um, applying the PCD to the outside of the device. Um, we do want to ensure that we're posing an additional challenge to compensate um, for the fact that we can't get into the device. So we do have to have uh, a good understanding of um, of the resistance patterns of, of the two, but certainly we, we do want to ensure that um, we've got a greater resistance if we're... we're um, putting the PCDs on the outside of the device. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Looks like we have time for maybe one or two more questions here. So our next question, what are the best practices for reducing or controlling bio burden? Um, certainly, so this needs to come into part of a, a broader bio burden control strategy um, used through the manufacturing process. So that can be everything from monitoring your incoming materials, uh, monitoring the environment um, and controlling the environment um, that you're doing your manufacturing process in. So that could be, for example, doing the process and the manufacturing uh, in a clean and controlled environment, for example, a, a clean room. Um, and also in terms of, um, of training your staff personnel, if you do have people interacting uh, with the devices, um, ensuring that there's an appropriate barrier between themselves uh, and the devices. All right. Well, thank you, Jennifer. That does look like all the time that we have for questions for today. I'd like to thank Fergus and Jennifer. QMED appreciates your time and your expertise on today's topic. We'd also like to thank everyone in the audience. We appreciate your attention and participation. Once again, if we didn't get to your question, someone will get back to you after the program is over. Please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who may not have been available to listen to today's event. This webinar is copyright 2019 by Informa. The presentation materials are owned by or copyright by QMED and Eurofins Medical Device Test. The individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and opinions. On behalf of our guests, I'm Chris Keach. Once again, we'd like to thank you for joining us, and we hope you have a great day.